This morning we begin a four-part sermon series on the faith journey from the Gospel of Matthew. So four separate stories that will be set out each week in our weekly lectionary, and they track the faith journeys of the disciples of Jesus. And in examining these faith stories, we may find a glimmer of recognition and hope for our own faith struggles as we strive to recognize Jesus as our God, to trust in his enlivening power even today, and to be courageous in our faithfulness to him. So before we begin, let me give you some background on the Gospel of Matthew. First, scholars know for certain that the text was written in Greek, and it was likely written between the years of 80 to 90 in our common era probably by a multilingual Israelite, someone with a sophisticated understanding of Israelite tradition and scribal argumentation. The Gospel of Matthew was not originally written to be a book of the Bible, but rather was intended to be a resource for a particular congregation, a group of worshiping and serving and striving Christians like us. So it was written to the church to help the Christian community understand and clarify and share its faith in Jesus as the Christ, just as we strive to do today. It was important to Matthew to show that because the disciples of Christ started out as having or being of little faith, and that was often the description used for them, you of little faith, Christ performed compassionate miracles to care for the people around him day after day. And this was for the disciples to see. It was through their first-hand witness of the saving power of Jesus that they finally recognized him as their merciful Lord, the Messiah. So in the hope that we too might recognize the mercy of the risen Christ in our lives, Let us turn now to the first of a series of miraculous events, something that had to be seen to be believed, the feeding of the 5,000. Let's begin with prayer. Extravagant God, we call on you this morning to remind us that with you all things are possible. You are the source of our strength and the provider of our care. Help us hear your message for our lives this morning that we might believe in you afresh and take courage that we can carry out your ministry of compassion for those who hunger for your love despite all odds. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord my rock, and our redeemer. Amen. My favorite neighborhood sushi chef is a man who moved to New York from Japan just a few years ago. The only sign he has posted on his restaurant window is a small postcard-sized piece of cardboard on which he is written by hand in a plain black sharpie Just two words. The sign says, trust me. (laughs) That's it. Trust me. As if to say, I will feed you well. When I go there, I always order omakase. And if you are a sushi aficionado, you probably know that to order omakase tells the sushi chef, I do trust you. Feed me whatever you think is best. If you're not a sushi fan, or you've never been to a sushi bar to banter with the sushi chef, then the world of omakase may be a mystery to you. So let me explain. Omakase is a wonderful dining experience. It requires you to trust in the culinary skill and creativity of the sushi chef. It offers the pleasure of watching the chef prepare your meal him slicing the fresh fish and combining the raw ingredients before your eyes. And it involves the chef placing his creation down before you 
with an air of pride and also humility. And in this way, he seems to be saying, this is my best. And he says it with a smile. Do you like it? And it doesn't end there. Now you taste and savor the delicious flavors, the surprising textures, the new combinations. And your response is immediate and spontaneous. Your eyes light up. You tilt your head back. You smile at the chef and say, this food is out of this world. That is what makes the omakase experience unique. It is a mutual experience of the chef feeding you special foods chosen and prepared for you by him and you being fed and expressing your satisfaction back. You feel both surprise, what will it be, and delight. This is delicious. So next time you go out for sushi, remember to order omakase. All it means is, I trust you. Now trust is the first step to faithfulness for the bewildered disciples who were faced with a crowd of thousands and instructions from Jesus to feed them dinner. Where does one begin? Not to give away too much, but trust in Jesus is a simple answer, and it begins with recognizing Jesus as Christ, as all-powerful and extravagant in his compassion for the world. Now, the miracle story of the feeding of the 5,000, or more like the 20,000 when you add in all the women and the children, offers us an early glimpse of just how generous Jesus could be. The story starts with Jesus receiving some bad news. His cousin John the Baptist has been killed. So he goes off in a boat on the great lake of Galilee to a quiet place. And the crowd follows him, walking along the shore until he rose into a remote spot. No towns or restaurants anywhere in sight. And he sees the crowds, and he is immediately filled with compassion. And he heals their sick. Matthew tells us that when Jesus ministered to the crowd, his compassion was stirred because he saw that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So the first thing he does in coming ashore is to heal them and care for them. And then when evening comes, the disciples urge Jesus to send the crowds home so that they can buy something to eat. Now the notion that the crowd members could buy their own food is a significant detail because it tells us that the crowds had the means to feed themselves. They were following Jesus as their teacher and as their healer, but not with the hope or need or expectation that they would be getting a free meal. Yet just then, Jesus gives the disciples this unexpected, impossible command. They need not go away, he tells them. You give them something to eat. Well, if ever there was a ministry baptism by fire, this was it. The disciples are stunned. We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish, they protest. What can we possibly do? So do you think Jesus was really talking about food? You give them something to eat, he said. But this was the master of parables, after all. Whether he wanted to offer them some physical nourishment or spiritual insight, we won't ever know. For the next thing he told them was, bring the loaves and fishes to me. And then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass. Now here, the original text in Greek is interesting because Jesus made them lie down rather than sit down. He used the verb for reclining, as was the normal posture for dining in the day, stretched out and propped up on one elbow. And Jesus made them lie down on the grass. And the Greek word used for grass 
is also the word for grain or food. It's almost as if Jesus was offering them a resting place with their noses in the larder. Open your eyes. See what is already at hand around you. Welcome to the kingdom. You can take care of yourselves. God has provided you with everything you need. But what really struck me, and what I found most compelling in this passage, and I wanted to share it with you, is that these words from the miracle story of the feeding of 5,000 are the same words of being made to lie down on the green grass by a lake that we heard in the 23rd Psalm that Lynn just read to us. I am convinced that the writer of Matthew's Gospel wanted us to hear the echo. Listen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And that is exactly what is going on here after all. Jesus has come to the people. They are like so many lost sheep, and they are grateful to hear his voice. Both he and they had just heard the terrible news of the execution of John the Baptist. There is worry in the air, concern now for all the followers of Jesus, whom John had said was more powerful than he. And Jesus appears to them with compassion. He makes them lie down on the green grassy hillside in a tranquil place on the shore of the great freshwater lake of Galilee. He feeds them and he gives them peace. You can go there today to the grassy hillside by the lake and see for yourself. You can imagine the scene. You can almost hear them praying the Psalms. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord all my whole life long. Yet still, I wonder, was Jesus offering them merely spiritual food, or was it the real thing? A lot of people try to prove or disprove the historicity of this miracle story. They get bogged down in the could it possibly be true aspect of scripture. They bypass that first step of faith, the first step of trusting in Jesus of acknowledging that Jesus is God, and therefore anything is possible with Jesus once you accept him as the Christ. But many of us are just like the far too practical disciples who right away wanted to point out it can't be done. All we've got is five loaves and two fish. Give me a break, Jesus. I can't pull off a miracle meal for 5,000 people. But Jesus insists that we can. It just takes teamwork. Now here's a story that illustrates the point for those who want proof that miracles can happen. But I have to warn you that I first heard this story from someone who heard it from someone else. He told me he thought it was true, but he wasn't sure, and now it's a third hand telling, so it could be true, but I'm not sure either. So listen and see what you think. The story starts out on a flight from New York to LA. It was not a direct flight, however. There was a scheduled stopover in Minneapolis. The first leg of the flight was fine, but then as they headed out of Minneapolis on the second leg of the flight to LA, 
the stewardess announced over the loudspeaker that there had been a mix-up in Minneapolis and the ground crew there had somehow forgotten to load onto the plane's cargo unit the carts that carry all the snacks. Now, this was back in the day when airlines provided snacks free of charge and soft drinks for everybody on board, a normal part of the flight experience. However, the stewardess continued, I am sure that many of you brought along something to eat from the airport concession stand back in New York, or maybe those of you who joined us in Minneapolis brought some food from home this morning. So if you would be willing to share with your neighbors what you brought along, then everyone who is hungry will have something to eat, just enough to carry them through until we land in LA. Well, needless to say, everybody on board was surprised by the announcement and more than a little disappointed that the airline forgot the snacks. But finally, a couple people got up and opened the overhead bins and dug around in their backpacks and their handbags, and sure enough, they found food. And one man called out, I've got two apples here. And a woman said, I have four energy bars. And a whole family from Brooklyn said, we've got a bag of bagels to share. And someone else had brownies individually wrapped. And a grandma had brought chocolate chip cookies. They were for her grandchildren in LA, but she said she could make more when she gets there, so she shared them all. <coughs> and before you know it, the inside of that airplane was like a county fair. The people were passing food around from row 10 to 22, and even first class was getting into the act. And people were chatting together, and friendships were made, and neighbors were friendly, and everyone agreed that grandma's chocolate chip cookies were the best. <laughs> and when they finally arrived in LA, the people said that it was the most remarkable airplane ride they'd ever taken. And with a little help from an enterprising stewardess, all ate and were filled. On the shores of Lake Galilee, the disciples gave Jesus five loaves and two fish. And Jesus took them and looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves. And he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Now whatever happened that day, whether the people came well equipped with their own picnics or were too ashamed to be fed so little by so few that they shared their own food instead, or if it was a blessing and giving of so little that miraculously became a never-ending quantity of so much. Whatever happened that day, there was enough food to provide leftovers that filled the baskets of the 12 disciples. And even if the food they received was in fact a feast of Christ's healing touch, a banquet of Christ's holy presence, spiritual food of reassurance, tranquility, peacefulness, and calm. One thing is known for certain. All ate and were filled. Christ gave seemingly little to the disciples, but finally trusting in Jesus, the disciples gave more than enough to feed the crowds. And in the same way, Christ invites all of you to come to this table, to trust that you will be fed, fed by Jesus the Christ who is our Lord, who provides for us all, who makes abundance from scarcity, who brings healing from hurt, who is love incarnate, the Lord, our shepherd. Jesus offers us more than enough. Let us be fed here at his table so that we may go out and feed his sheep. Trust me, Jesus says, take, eat. This is my body given for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Amen.